Hey. I'm just going to mute you right now. Just a quick technical issue. Just one moment. We'll get started. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. We'll uh, we'll get started. Uh, so uh, we'll call to order. And uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mayor Patterson, we have quorum. Okay. Hey. Uh, thank you. So we have. Um, Looks like we have committee to hold a closed meeting. By Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor McLaren. The council resolve itself into the committee of the whole closed meeting to consider the following item. Proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board, King Street property. There you go. Okay, uh, so uh, we'll ask then for the motion to move into committee of the whole. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, and that's carried. So folks, just a reminder that now uh, we're gonna leave this meeting. The clerk is gonna send us a link to the WebEx meeting and I will see you all very shortly. participants tab open. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Sego ani buju endio wachia kwe kwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So we were just meeting in Committee of the Whole closed meeting. We did have uh, one uh, discussion uh, with respect to uh, proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land, uh, a King Street property. Uh, so with that, I will ask for a motion to uh, rise without reporting, please. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Holland, that Council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting without reporting. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, next uh, we have the approval of the adits. We have uh, three motions of condolence and then one new motion. Uh, can I have a mover of the adits, please? Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Osanic. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. We have no presentations. We have no delegations. Uh, we do have a briefing that is, is later on in the agenda. Are there any petitions to present? Okay, seeing none, we will move to motions of condolence. Uh, first moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the family and friends of Heather Roberts, Director of Solid Waste Services, on the passing of her father-in-law, Larry Roberts of Leamington, Ontario, on Thursday, April 30th, 2020, at the age of 84. Mr. Roberts was a retired high school teacher and a political enthusiast. He will be sorely missed and our thoughts are with his family during this difficult time. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that the sincere condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the family and friends of the victims of the helicopter accident off the coast of Greece. Sub-Lieutenant Abigail Cowbro, Captain Brendan Ian McDonald, 
Captain Kevin Hagen and Captain Maxime Iran Morin were all graduates of Kingston's Royal Military College. We are deeply saddened by this news and our thoughts are with the families of the victims of this tragic accident. Moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that the condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the friends and family of Cameron Burns, project manager, facilities management and construction services from the passing of his father, George Rogers Burns on April 29th, 2020. George will be dearly missed by all those that knew him. So we will call the vote, please. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. We have no deferred motions. So we will move on to reports. And first we have report number 39 from Planning Committee. Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Kiley, that report number 39 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. So there are three clauses in report 39. Would anyone like any of them separated? Okay, seeing none, then we will vote on them as a whole. So clause one is approval of an application for final plan of condominium 311 Conacher Drive. Number two, approval of an application for zoning bylaw amendment 305 and 323 Rideau Street. Number three, approval of an application for zoning bylaw amendment 200 Civet Avenue. We will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Next, we have report number 40 from Heritage Kingston. Moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that report number 40 from Heritage Kingston be received and adopted. Would anyone like any of the uh, items in the Heritage Kingston report separated? Okay, seeing none, then we will vote on the report as a whole. There are items uh, that are both under statutory and non-statutory consultation. So we will call the vote on the report. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Uh, information reports, we do have an information report, but before that we have a briefing. Donna Gillespie, Chief Executive Officer of KECO, will brief Council with respect to information report number one, COVID-19 Business Response Recovery Plan. Good evening, okay. Mayor. You have the floor. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Councillors, CAO Hurdle, and City staff. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you this evening. We know that COVID-19 has changed the economic landscape locally, nationally, and globally. With rapidly changing realities, Kingston has been facing unprecedented challenges over the last seven weeks. From layoffs and business shutdowns to navigating government relief programs, calls for PPE production and supplies, our businesses, our employers, our workforce and our community has been impacted. This is a very unsettling time for most. The Kingston Economic Development Corporation has brought forward a short-term recovery plan and an update on what we have been doing, hearing, and a direction to go with the understanding that we don't have full clarity on what the future holds or full direction from the province and public health at this time. As we begin this presentation, I'd like to underscore that this rapidly evolving situation, the report before you is a living document and one that will continue to evolve. We have prioritized our staff resources and budgets to focus on supporting our local business community and will continue to adjust our plans as the community needs us to. We have identified, thanks Derek, we've identified three phases to address economic stabilization. We must work in unison to prepare Kingston for each step forward. Today we need to survive. And I can't stress enough that our business community is in survival mode and will be for the foreseeable near future. Our priority is to support, support local businesses through the current crisis to reopening, whatever day that may be, and through possible multi-year adjustments and recovery. We need to limit the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the local economy with health and safety of employees and consumers top of mind. Over the coming months, we need to recover 
reorient and adapt. This goes hand in hand with survival as recovery is going to be challenging, require a lot of planning and thoughtful considerations. We need to help visualize our community's new normal with input from businesses and stakeholders and develop well-aligned plans with KFLNA Public Health and the City of Kingston to assist companies in reopening planning. We need to understand how it can be rolled out and how we can ensure our economic reopening is as successful as our current public health results. Over the medium to long term, we need to plan to renew our community. As we progress through these first two stages, we can develop our long-term economic development strategy. Kingston has a lot of assets, and I honestly believe that these advantages can set us ahead of other communities over the longer term. But this evening is about the immediate short-term survival. Could you advance the slide, Derek? Thank you. We have identified seven key focus areas and developed tactical action items in the short term with phases for each step. We must be prepared that most business operations will not go back to the pre-COVID normal once reopening happens. Social distancing requirements may be in effect for the foreseeable future, making some existing business models not financially viable. There are many questions before us, and I wanted to pick out three this evening to highlight, one being what the future of work looks like to accommodate employee health and safety, staggered shifts, space redesign, and increased remote work. On-campus learning. With the statement yesterday from Queens, we understand that fall on-campus learning is still being discussed. As a major employer, as well as host to over 20,000 students, we need to work as a community to be a health and safe and healthy city for parents to send their children to. Queens has a significant economic impact on Kingston, a reality that does not always make media headlines. And consumer behavior. We don't fully understand the changing needs of consumers going forward. The shift from in-store to online, the potential reduction in consumption and consumerism, these are all very big unknowns. Eric, could you go to the next slide? The first area of focus is an analysis and risk assessment. We have a snapshot of where we were pre-COVID. From the essential business list, it is not difficult to see who immediately has been hit the hardest. In early April, the Conference Board of Canada issued a report ranking Kingston as one of the top five Canadian cities for percentage of workforce lost due to COVID-19 in tourism and hospitality. The pie chart provides an illustration of the workforce in Kingston and potential risks. As indicated in the report, 23% of our workforce falls under the high risk category, which includes food services and accommodations, arts and entertainment, and retail trade. 20% is in the medium risk category and 57% are in the lower risk, though the emphasis is on lower, not without risk. Since the middle of March, we have been proactively reaching out to companies across sectors to hear from them impacts and in some cases opportunities and provide support. To date, we have logged over 200 direct outreach calls. Last week, we issued a formal business performance survey in partnership with the city and business agencies to collect data that we can compare to pre-COVID business retention and expansion surveys issued in 2018 and 2019. We plan to look at reissuing quarterly surveys to monitor where businesses are at, how they have accessed relief programs, their business forecast and employment rates. As of this morning, there are over 100 responses. Our biggest source of intelligence does come from speaking directly with business owners. What we have heard very clearly includes, small businesses cannot handle the burden of more debt. They worry about too many deferments with reopening dates unclear. Small mom and pop shops, especially those who do not put themselves on payroll, solopreneurs and pre-revenue companies remain limited in their government support options. 
businesses that are considered essential and have been able to remain open are faced with cautious clients, delayed supply chains, and projects being put on hold. Dry goods retail store owners are sitting with hundreds of thousands of dollars of spring merchandise in their store. While many restaurants have been able to generate sales through delivery, contactless pickup, or pre-made meals, sales come nowhere close to replacing pre-COVID revenue. As provinces begin to shed hope on reopening phases, the reality of maintaining social distancing requirements and what that means for space redesign brings frightening forecasts. A 100-seat cruise boat may only be able to accommodate 25 passengers. A 200-seat meeting room or auditorium may only accommodate 40 people. A 50-seat restaurant, your hairdresser, your chiropractor, it's hard to fully understand what this will look like at reopening. The pre-COVID business model does not work right now. The answers are not yet clear how many can remain financially viable and for how long. The longer businesses are closed, the shorter the survival runway becomes. We are hearing increasingly commercial tenants are, requesting exist, are questioning existing leases and attempting to negotiate terms or not choosing to renew. Businesses shuttered for two months desperately need guidelines for safe reopening. We receive calls daily for guidance, what PPE they will need, what should they be buying now before supply chains get overwhelmed, where do they buy what and from where. The city has been working closely with public health and meetings are underway this week to address these questions. Next slide, Derek. So how are we going to navigate this? First, we need a Team Kingston approach. The pandemic is greater than all of us and the community has come together working with all agencies and stakeholders to support our economy and our businesses. I applaud the mayor for launching a Kingston economic recovery team and I'm proud to offer our organization as a resource and administrative support in however we can serve. The board has also approved in principle to use the bulk of its available reserves for this crisis, which we expect to be around $500,000. We wanna support the hardest hit sectors and maximize participation in provincial and federal finance programs. Representatives from our business agencies, the Chamber, Downtown Kingston, Kingston Accommodation Partners, Tourism Kingston, along with the city, MPP, Community Foundation, and Employment Ontario have been meeting daily to share what we are learning, hearing, thinking, and planning. Our business development officer has been participating in weekly business response calls with the Frontenac County Economic Development Group and Frontenac CFDC. This is not the time for duplication of effort. Rather, we need to work together to pool resources and share knowledge. Next slide, Derek. Continuing with the Team Kingston approach, the Smith School of Business at Queen's University has mobilized its talent, their professors, administrators, and students, and launched the Kingston Region Small Business Network, which includes a community classroom to bring access for local businesses to experts in their field. And another key part of this network is an applied work experience platform to connect student response teams to local businesses as they go through this survival phase. Likewise, the 54 Ontario Small Business Enterprise Centers of which Kingston Economic Development is one, have been meeting remotely to share program delivery, opening workshops and resources as we've all gone digital so that small business owners across the province can access. An immediate focus for our office was to create a comprehensive online COVID-19 website with up-to-date information on how businesses can get in touch with our staff working remotely, government announcements and relief programs, industry-specific resources, and reopening guidelines and best practices as they are released. If you've not had a chance to visit, please go to kingstonactdev.com, and at the top of the page, you'll see a big red alert banner. We have also by choice fast-tracked the rollout of a number of programs such as Starter Company Plus, Summer Company, and FedDev's Women Entrepreneurship Programs, 
recognizing that local businesses could benefit from the $200,000 in direct funding and resources. Next slide, Derek. An important element of our direction is to support keeping local dollars in the community. Together with Downtown Kingston, Tourism Kingston, Chamber Accommodation Partners and the city, we are launching a Love Kingston consumer campaign this week. By pooling our resources, including media buys, we have created a campaign to encourage and assist Kingstonians in navigating an online Kingston. We need to rally the community to support immediate revenue generation to increase the survival rate of existing businesses. The key is a cohesive strategy, consistent messaging and collaboration. We recognized we needed to do it together rather than having desperate campaigns. The campaign developed consists of a brand, identity, consistent messaging and a call to action with a place to go to find out how you can support local businesses and offers a positive consumer experience. The reality is even before COVID-19, we have been competing with the Amazons of the world. Now more than ever, we need to consciously think about where we spend our consumer dollars and the impact that has for keeping our small independent businesses surviving, who in turn employ our family, our kids, our neighbors, and support our charities and youth teams. As part of keeping dollars in the local community, longer term outlook needs to be focused on local supply chains and at anchor institution procurement policies and how we can use those to stimulate the economy from within. Next slide, please. Last fall, we benefited with funding to lead a provincial digital Main Street program in partnership with downtown Kingston. By the end of March this year, we were able to connect over 80 local businesses with small grants totaling just over $100,000 to support digitizing their business. We have continued the program, expanded the boundaries beyond downtown Williamsville and Portsmouth, and furthered our partnership with Shopify to support business transition to online sales platforms. Going digital also speaks to the future of how we need to be able to work supporting our digital literacy, advocating for broadband and greater connectivity, especially in our rural areas. As the reality is that future waves of the pandemic could bring the hammer down again. We have come a long way in eight weeks, but there's still far more to go. Next slide, please. An important element I wanted to flag in our direction is manufacturing in Kingston. It's a small, steady and rebounding sector of our economy. With the national need for PPE production, communicating opportunities to our local manufacturers and connecting them to government decision makers has been an important aspect of our work since late March. Local manufacturers have also consistently risen to the local asks for sharing of PPE supplies for frontline workers. As we begin to look at reopening of different sectors of the economy, making connections with suppliers for local needs is all the more important, an industrial shop local initiative. Work is just beginning to unfold as we look at a reopening stage and with Employment Ontario and the city to address displacement of workers in the short term, retraining and helping people get back to work. Revisiting the Conference Board of Canada report I referenced at the beginning, Kingston is one of Canada's top five cities with a workforce most impacted by COVID-19. Final slide, Derek. It takes a community to build a community and we must go hand in hand with public health on a gradual reopening of the economy. While we are navigating uncertain times, I am very proud of our team, our city, our partners, our businesses and the community who have risen to the health care call. We plan to be back in September with an update on our activities. Until then, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, I'm just looking around the, the Zoom screen. Councillor Hodgson.
presentation. It's a good report. Uh, can you, you can hear me now? Okay. So um, it's a really good report. I think it's clear and relatively comprehensive as best as could be done and touches a lot of bases. So um, I'm satisfied to see that Kitco is using its, re, uh, its reserves because if they're not gonna use them now, I don't know when they would. So that's good to see. I'm just wondering uh, as a matter of due diligence, are the corporate wind up costs still covered? Because that was always an issue at the Kitco board. Correct. So within our unrestricted reserves, we anticipate there's approximately $725,000. We're looking at around 500,000 initially for this stage of recovery. So that, that's more than two thirds of the available corporate reserves. And we have included all restricted projects to strategic planning, as well as any uh, liabilities, which the corporation holds. Good, so that's covered. Okay, good. My second question has to do with exhibit A, um, page 102, this hopefully won't stretch your memory too much. The, um, it has to do with um, terminology I didn't uh, quite get. And that is, it talks about percentages of uh, workers in each sector and that was really useful information. Uh, what is the business count? The business count would be the number of individual businesses within each NAICS code. Oh, okay, good. So you can just follow that across and relate it to right. the number of people employed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Next on my list is uh, Deputy Mayor Neal. Hello, thank you. Um, a couple of things. I noticed um, you talking about an on-campus uh, Queen's startup in the fall. Uh, I, that may be somewhat optimistic. I've, I've had an interesting conversation with, with Queen's on that subject. I think there's a number of universities that are looking to do more digital learning, online learning. And uh, so, I'll just say that up front and hopefully um, I'll leave it up to KFLNA Public Health and uh, to, to make that determination in conjunction with Queens. Um, the other uh, comment I had, um, how much uh, organization are you looking to uh, work collaboratively with the community on uh, on achieving your goals. Okay, so uh, Ms. Gillespie. Uh, if I could address the first comment by Councillor Neal, I apologize for any miscommunication. Queens yesterday did make a statement saying that they were still considering all options. So I did not mean to indicate that a decision in any way had been made. I believe they're working closely with Dr. Walker and KFLNA Public Health Unit um, to assess the situation. I appreciate that. Uh, with regards to outreach to organizations and the community, both in the Team Kingston approach, we have been part of twice weekly check-in calls that the mayor has coordinated. It's so important to hear how the different cultural and social organizations are also responding. Uh, I'm part of a not-for-profit group led by Community Foundation and again um, being around the, the social service providers and understanding the challenges they are facing. A big concern is a lot of our business clients may become some of their clients down the road as we see the vulnerable population of the community shift. I, I appreciate that and I'm glad that that uh, commitment has been made. The other thing is sometimes in the past when there's been uh, organized a, a kind of plan, uh, sometimes the group that sometimes gets left out is labor. Uh, and we have a very good district labor council here in 
in, in Kingston. Are you engaging them in, uh, in your plans and process? To date, I have not had direct contact with the District Labor Council, but that's certainly um, a very important point that we'll want to make sure as we're looking at further recovery plans, um, the impact on the workforce and our longer term uh, strategies. I appreciate that. They're a vital uh, part of our recovery, I think. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Councillor Hill. Thank you. Uh, just, just a couple of things, uh, Donna, and thank you for the presentation. Obviously, a lot of hard work uh, uh, on behalf of all your staff that's gone into this, so we appreciate that. So I'm not a business person, uh, and I guess I'm asking, what advice would, so you've got someone who's operating a small business that has been closed up to now, uh, they're given the opportunity to open up and they're, they're calling to look, I guess, for assistance. How would you put the expertise of Team Kingston, I guess, to use for them, just as a practical example? So, so first, for any small business owner, I would encourage them to reach out. Uh, they can reach out through the Economic Development Office, downtown Kingston, the Chamber. As service providers, we're all sharing information and, and helping to triage. If you go to our COVID-19 resource page, we have all of our business advisors online, as well as an easy to click book, a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call, which highlights uh, needing assistance with various things from reopening through to navigating government grants. Um, with that, um, once we have an opportunity to assess their needs and their questions, we can also then refer into the Smith School of Business uh, network. And what about it? Like, so it was a small manufacturing firm. I'm thinking more, you know, supply chain kinds of things. Like, how how would you link a small manufacturing firm to the supply chain that's local? So Ian Murdoch, who has been our point on COVID nineteen uh, response, uh, he's our business retention and expansion officer. He has been working very closely with with the manufacturing community and has a network of over 80 local manufacturers that he corresponds with as soon as any government opportunities comes out or if there's any calls for PPE. Certainly, uh, he's staying very closely connected with that group. Well, I mean, this kind of links back to what Councillor Neal was asking, I think, but, you know, there's lots of citizens, residents that want to help out in some, some way. Is there kind of a line of advice that you would give to citizens about how they could assist us? I would say number one, first and foremost, for people in the community who want to support our local businesses, we need to shop local. Our consumer dollars matter so much and to challenge ourselves to see how we can keep money in the community for our small independents our, or our local employers. Um, beyond keeping money in the community and spending money in the community. Certainly if somebody wanted to reach out to provide support and they have an area of expertise or they wanted to connect to an, a local organic group such as YG Cares, um, they can certainly reach out directly to me or any of my team and we'll be happy to make that connection. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sanek. Thank you, your worship. And through you, two questions to Ms. Gillespie. Um, in the report, um, you just mentioned that 200 phone calls have been made as part of the, um, the outreach that's been done to businesses. Um, we're, like, what directory do we use to make those phone calls? Um, are we certain that that is the right outreach or are there, um, I just don't want any companies to be missed. So um, are we confident that those 200 phone calls you know, is a good representation of all the businesses. Um, can we increase that when we do the next phase and do the business impact surveys? Can we try to even do more than 200? That's an excellent question. And certainly we all have our, our call trees that we have been given and assigned um, that are mapped out by different sectors. Ian's been tremendous at going through uh, Salesforce as well, which is our, our CRM management platform. Um, as well as looking at the community and assigning the team with call targets so that we can make sure that we're, we're reaching out 
And that's something that we believe is very important to continue to do is the direct outreach to businesses above and beyond the, the, the survey. Okay. And uh, tonight you just mentioned that brand new um, shop local campaign called Love Kingston. Um, where do people find that? Has it officially been launched? And do we just Google Love Kingston or where do we get to that part of the website you just showed? We're just, excellent question. We're just a few days away from having lovekingston.ca. Okay. Love, that would be the online platform. We had hoped to be able to, to launch it before this evening's meeting, but um, sometimes every check mark doesn't happen in COVID days. We're working towards that with a great team from the city of tourism and DK. Uh, so print ads have been filed and I would see that the website will be live and social media uh, marketing will begin hopefully Thursday or Friday. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is uh, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation and for all the work um, so far. The I guess the first comment I have is just that you know we've all we've all seen that in the past number of weeks that the that there's a real gendered component to uh, what's been happening in the economy, and we're hopeful that we'll see. Um, a move towards daycares and summer camps and things in the coming months. But is there a plan? Will there be some sort of local solution available um, to help out with the needs of people who are currently on the front lines, first of all, who maybe don't or haven't fit into the category uh, set out by the province and therefore haven't been able to access that um, free essential childcare service? And secondly, for the next phase of, of opening so that our workers um, can, can go back to work and, and be sure that their families are cared for. We have definitely heard that numerous times from frontline workers from essential businesses who are either the owners or accommodating staff who have child care needs. I do know this is on the city's radar and I've spoken with Craig Desjardins clearly about it. I don't know what the solution is right now, but I do know it is a top of my priority, especially as we start to look at reopening. And so any of the feedback that you're soliciting at this point, like so people who have those concerns, would they be sending those through to the city or are those more um, in line with what's happening with the work of the economic ta task? For you, I don't fully know all of the topics that the economic response team is going to tackle, but I, I, I would bank money that this is going to be a very important one. Great, thank you. That's Ostroff. Yes, thank you, um, Mayor Patterson, and um, I too want to thank uh, Donna for the report and. Um, having sitting on the economic development. Um, I know that even producing this report uh, must, must have felt a little bit anxious because it, it probably is um, a little bit early, but maybe, maybe the report's right on time too, uh, Donna. And um, because um, we are entering the first phase of, um, of uh, restarting our economic engine and um, you know, being a local businessman and connected with uh, the community in, in, in that way pretty deeply, I, um, I also um, feel the pain as we all will feel the pain, but certainly as a, a representative of, of uh, on council and economic development. And, um, I, you know, it's certainly, certainly something that I, um, I can really relate to. And I, I thank you for the language of this report as well. I think it speaks our language and um, that it gives us uh, some hope as a business community and it, we feel like uh, we're not alone. And so that's a great thing. And uh, I thank you for that. And I, I guess the one, I have a lot of comments to make, but I wanted to, uh, the question was, you mentioned the very, very end, that uh, sort of like a see you in September thing. Uh, it certainly won't be that, I'm sure, because we have the, the mayor's uh, task force or economic, but it, it will, 
we will hear regularly from economic development. Uh, is that is that not correct, uh, Donna? For you, most certainly. I didn't mean to indicate that it would be radio silence until September. We do have a standing uh, check-in yes. uh, report that we uh, indicated that we would bring back in September. So we wanted to make sure that we had a standing uh, report back timeline. But okay. yeah, increased communication with council and the community is very important. Yeah, well, I might, I might even say I, I, I think we need should have some kind of economic report monthly uh, uh, for from economic development is my suggestion. I haven't even <laughs> just think about it now because um, it's a, it, like you said, this is a live document and uh, the document, but also, uh, you know, we've never done this before, right? And uh, I, I am excited in a sense of a business uh, waiting for phase two, but not just for myself. I think uh, uh, of all, uh, everyone, you know, that many, many have come to me. Where, where, where does my business, uh, you know, fit in that, in the, in the three phases? Where, where do I fit? And, uh, and, uh, and so everyone is, is eager. It's like holding our breath for, uh, you know, six weeks or whatever it's been right now, almost eight weeks. But so that's, I think we recognize that. And I think that we have great resources through uh, the, the university and the college, but also um, we can never underplay our own um, associations. Uh, I want to encourage people um, to, we need to encourage people. Uh, it's about how we, how we do this. How so we, so yeah. yeah so so sorry, I, I, I know you're on the vein, but I just want to just remind people it's, it's questions. Okay. Uh, at the briefing well so. that's part of the education i just want to encourage economic development is that people are coming to me and uh and asking what do we got to do and i'm really hoping that the uh, economic development can be that constant voice of educating and informing the business community that's really what we're we're needing and what are the resources and uh, that kind of assistance so it's all about communicating really well and regularly and be a, a, a source for solutions thank you okay Thank you. Um, so next on my list for questions, I have uh, Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Uh, I just, I do have a, a number of questions. Uh, it strikes me that there's been a lot of work put into this uh, this package here, and, and KEDCO has some very talented staff. We're able to action items rapidly to support local businesses. I'm very pleased that over 200 outreach events have taken place, and that's certainly a great start. Um, one of my questions is based on the graphs you provided, and it's I, I think it's evident to everyone, the highest risk sectors in Kingston appear to be downtown and small businesses in the tourism-related industry, both of which have business representation of their own, Tourism Kingston with uh, Ms. Megan Knott, and of course, uh, Doug Ritchie with the BIA. And given that their teams, um, have laid off um, people recently. Uh, how has the economic development team that we have adjusted the workload to support the highest risk sectors of the Kingston through the Team Kingston approach highlighted in the recovery plan? Thank you. So certainly we do work very closely with the DBIA and Tourism Kingston and they're very strong entities. So we're, we're blessed as a community to have those groups. With regards to how are we focusing our energies, again, there has been the outreach. It is important to support the tourism sector, as well as small businesses in food accommodation and retail across the city who might not necessarily have um, direct BIA or be part of the tourism community, but still are highly impacted in the, the East and West End. The second question is, in reading the report, much of the very impactful programs and supports discussed in rollout of phase two in regard to surveys, business retention surveys, et cetera, manufacturing, supply chain, uh, looking at training and business connections. It looks like a lot of very, very important and meaningful work to me. So how has the economic development team positioned themselves to be impactful within this se sector and successful with these initiatives? Thank you, that's a good question. The first task after the state of emergency was declared for me was to make sure to close the office, um, have staff able to work remotely, and to appoint a lead COVID response business development officer. Um, we check in regularly in terms of what resources are required and how to hit the ground running. 
are, still are in the very early stages and we recognize that we're going to need more resources and more assistance, but we wanna make sure we're, we're doing that in a strategic way. So right now Ian is leading the charge and doing a brilliant job, an admirable job. And I do look to him and the rest of the team for insights in terms of making sure that we are resourcing and bringing in community partners as appropriate to roll out exceptional programs. Uh, another question I have is in looking at this and planning out the strategy that you have in place, what are the measurable objectives that you have in order to identify if your efforts have been successful for the business community? Thank you. Within the report, and I apologize if my pages are slightly different than your full council package, but of exhibit A, bottom right hand corner, it would be uh, the table figure three, starting on page 19, which identifies anticipated outcomes. So we're still working on during this period what key performance indicators would look like. We have internal targets for reaching out for outreach calls, uh, the call trees, the survey targets to know that if we, uh, we are getting the numbers that we want. We have outlined a number of anticipated outcomes for each of the initiatives that we hope to, to meet and be able to report back on regularly as we go through the phases. Hey, I, I, and my final comment is uh, seeing how quickly you're able to put together this report um, and seeing that we seem to have a lot of very talented people within the uh, corporation itself. I really would like to uh, question the viability of hiring outside consultants to do the majority of work for the strategic plan. That's, that's just a comment. I'll leave that with you. Uh, and thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Doherty. Thank you, and through you, um, Donna. Thanks for your report. Um, um, that was very, uh, very well done, uh, and the presentation. Um, my question is around the uh, five hundred thousand reserve, and wondering what kind of um, long-term flexibility you have built into your budgeting, because of course one of the uh, first of all, we are all concerned about uh, um, our our um, businesses and employers and, and, and staff, but we also know that this is a long term, it may be long term and we may there may be a second wave. So I'm just wondering in your budgeting, what kind of uh, long term flexibility you have built into this? Thank you. Certainly that's a very serious question that the finance committee at the economic development office, as well as the board will be looking at. We completely respect um, the financial pressures the municipality is facing. I believe there's still a lot of unknowns in terms of what other levels of government support may come down um, to support economic development recovery issues. Uh, a portion of our budget is linked right now to provincial contracts, which are in place through 2022. Our federal contributions, we do have uh, some specific Fed Dev programs that have contracts, um, though some of our, our program funding through the feds is on an annual basis. So we'll need to really reassess as we move through to, to see what our budget constraints are and what that looks like going forward. Thanks. And uh, next is Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. And I echo my colleagues' comments about the thoroughness of this report and how quickly it was put together. One thing the report contemplated, but I didn't think fully addressed, so maybe you can play it out here for us, Donna, is if a second wave or a third wave is to come. Because the graphs we saw and the language of the report is quite linear. So if another wave were heaven forbid to come, would we revert back to the first phases or how does that work uh, as the situation unfolds? That's an excellent question, Councillor Kiley. And, and to be honest, I don't have uh, the roadmap necessarily on how to navigate uh, the pandemic. I, I do follow reports and, and the World Health Organization has clearly said the worst is yet to come. 
uh, with regards to some of our initiatives, uh, looking at things like going digital and making sure that uh, we have an online city to support uh, our local businesses, be it food or retail or services, so that if uh, we do enter a phase of shutdown again or, or uh, closures of whatever they look like, that we have that infrastructure in place. So looking at that as a longer term investment. Also looking at um, really advocating and working with the city and utilities and other entities on, on broadband access to rural areas. Uh, it's very difficult for good good cellular or broadband reception. So that's very important um, for the long term of the community. Councilor Kylie, did you have a did you have another question? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. One more question, and thank you for the response, Ms. Gillespie, is about um, something also mentioned in the report that I'm hoping you could maybe give a bit more context to, which is specific ways the city can help um, ECDEV or local small businesses. Uh, I know that there's mention about um, a regional business support network or a response team of students, so a few different things were mentioned, but Will you be coming back to council with certain requests from businesses? I guess I'm building off Councillor Ustroff here, for example, lowering property tax or waiving fees that the city charges. Will there be direct things that we hear through you from the business community? That's another good question. So I work very closely with Craig Desjardins out of the CAO's office and have close communication with the CAO as well as the mayor. Uh, who sits on our board, really that has been our conduit to bring uh, issues forward. With the mayor's economic recovery team, that may be another conduit to be able to share uh, what we're hearing and requests from businesses. Excellent. We look forward to it. And I think you have a very receptive audience ready to help. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands. So uh, let's be thank you for, for that and we will uh, find in our agenda. So we have no other information reports. Uh, we have no information reports from members of council. Uh, miscellaneous business, we do have a couple of motions. First, that the resignation of Sarah Sang from the Arts Advisory Committee be... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Hutchison? Do we have uh, the opportunity to make more comment on the um, report? I mean, usually there's a briefing and then there's this kind of, well, usually a recommendation of some sort, but not in this case. Not in this case, this is an information report. So this question- But I, I deliberately, just to say, okay, I deliberately just kept a short, quick questions because, and was a bit surprised to see commentary going on. Right. So I, you know what, I, I, I try to give people some leeway, uh, you know, when they ask a question. Of that, but I thought like, the report itself would come up. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, so that we had a briefing and then we had the report and then we had questions uh, for, uh, for the report. Uh, I think as was implied by the last question from Councillor Kylie, there will be lots of other opportunities when there are actual recommendations that are coming forward to council to have further debate and discussion. But at this point, uh, it's just uh, just question and answer. So, uh, so, so with that, thank you. So we will, again, just uh, looking at Ms. Laney's business, our first, uh, first motion that the resignation of Sarah Sang from the Arts Advisory Committee be received with regret. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Uh, next, number two, that as requested by Tina Bailey Community Foundation for Kingston Area Council proclaimed June 1st, 2020 as Community Foundation for Kingston and Area Day in Kingston. Moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Kiley. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Okay, on to uh, new motions. We do have one new motion on the added. I'm going to turn the chair over to Deputy Mayor Neal if he's uh, able to uh, to read the motion. I would like to, but I don't have the motion in front of me. So oh, okay, if okay. I could pass it along, I could go to it, but I'd have to uh, close this 
to get into okay. my computer. Um, let me let me see. Okay, um, I see, Councillor Councillor Kylie. Do you do you have the that motion in front of you? Would you be, much uh, more. Councillor Kylie, if you would be so kind as to take the chair, read the motion. That would be great. I do move by Mayor Patterson, second by Deputy Mayor Neal, that section 4.30 of the Council Procedural Bylaw be waived in order to allow, on a go-forward go basis, a maximum of three delegations that pre-register with the City Clerk's Department before the meeting, an opportunity to delegate before Council and Committee. And this requires a two-third vote. Uh, So will I, I'll give the chair back to Deputy Mayor Neal. And I recognize uh, the mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. So this is uh, simply to allow, uh, starting in our, our future, future meetings, uh, both for uh, council meetings and also for committee meetings to, to begin to open things up for delegations. Um, it's not clear how much longer we're going to be doing our meetings by Zoom, uh, but I think that this is, this is a new normal and I think we have to be prepared uh, to, to manage in a virtual setting for the foreseeable future. Uh, so given that, uh, you know, we've been through a crisis phase the last number of weeks. I think we've had some time now to, to adjust to this setting and we've got a great staff team at the clerk's office uh, and our own IT staff that are, are here to support. So I think that we're ready to take that step and to be able to, to invite uh, public input as required. Obviously, as you can see, the, the suggestion here is that you would still need to pre-register with the city clerk's office. Um, obviously, it's not as, as easy as, as it might have been in, in the past, uh, being able to, to, to connect and get a Zoom link and get you on with those things. But I think that uh, the time is, has come to be able to allow for that, particularly as we will be dealing with more substantive uh, issues and uh, and we will have debates on important issues and hearing from the public I think is important in that. So that's the uh, the context uh, by which this motion has come forward and certainly I would hope that uh, council would be able to support it. Thank you very much. And if I could pass on again to Councillor Kiley, I just had a couple of quick comments. I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this motion. The only thing that I kind of puzzled a little bit about was often on when there's something fairly uh, noteworthy, I won't say contentious, but noteworthy on the agenda from the floor of council, we're able to recognize more than just three, even though that's what the bylaw says. And I know it's the logistics of doing something like that are a little bit more problematic when we're zooming our way to uh, our meet through our meetings. But if we had some kind of a time deadline and a uh, counselor moving or seconding uh, a potential speaker, otherwise what will happen is what happened in sometimes in the past where uh, three people on one side of a uh, of an issue will get on the agenda and basically block the ability of others uh, to bring forward their ideas. So uh, I would definitely appreciate if if we could find a way to consider doing something that would allow us to go beyond three. If if uh, we have members of the public that wish to to make comment. So, and if you will return the chair, I'll recognize the mayor. <laughs> thank you, I do, I return the chair to you. And I recognize the mayor. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just to, to respond to that question, just conferring with, uh, with the clerk, what we could do is we could set a deadline of, of 12 noon uh, on the day of a, a council or committee meeting that would then allow for uh, uh, those additions to be put on the added side. So not something that I think needs to be written uh, into the, the motion in front of us, but it is something that we could manage. And I would presume that we would also therefore uh, have 
to have a mover and a seconder from council to get to acknowledge and get them on. I, I think that's a good, good remedy. Thank you. And I will call the question if I don't see any other hands. I don't think I do. So Deputy Mayor Neal, uh, this is the meeting host chiming in. Uh, there's a few people with hands up. I have seen uh, uh, Councillor McLaren's and I'll just ask other people to raise their hands and I will relay along to you who wishes to speak. I don't see everybody on my screen and that's my fault again. So if you can give me a hint, uh, I will recognize Councillor Kiley. Uh, well, Councillor uh, McLaren had his hand up, so I'm okay. going to uh, give Councillor McLaren the floor then. Thank you very much. Thank you. So does this anything in this motion actually prevent people right now, like say for the next council meeting from actually coming in delegation beyond three? Can a fourth person come if we need to at this point? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so so just to, to, to respond to that, so the way that it's written, it says from a, on a go forward basis. So if council passes this motion tonight, and that would then put the in place, the opportunity to pre-register with the city clerk's office. If those three spots are filled, then there's an opportunity for council to then move a motion to waive the procedural bylaw to add for say a fourth or a fifth delegation. The only thing that is different, you would need to have that motion to the clerk's office by noon in order to be able not only to get the addits, but then time to be able to make the, the technical details work to get them on Zoom. Thank you. Okay, so if I understand this, there's really no change except for a deadline till noon instead of the um, minutes before that part of the agenda comes in. Is that correct? May I ask about the uh, technical requirements here? You can just get a link Zoom, a Zoom link um, like minutes before the meeting. Um, why do we still need six hours or seven hours? So I'm going to look to someone from the clerk's office to jump in on that one. Thank you. Okay. Through, through you, Councillor. Uh, Deputy Mayor, the, uh, the reality with this is we need to get the addendum out and we need to put some timeline uh, training with uh, some of our members of the community that do want to register and participate in the meeting. So uh, we arbitrarily picked uh, 12 o'clock as time that would allow staff to do what they need to do. Uh, at the same time, put the wheels in motion to allow the members of the, of the community to participate in the meetings. Okay. Um, in the past, or had to put them onto the uh, add-ins. I mean, that was uh, something we could do, but in the past, we've also done at the very last minute and they weren't on the add-ins. What has changed that we need to put them on the add-ins now and we can't do it the way we did before? It's the timing to be able to get the information through to the uh, member of the community to be able to participate. It also leads into the idea of being able to troubleshoot uh, and provide some potential training and opportunity for the member of the public to be able to participate. I think that would be overcome much easier than seven hours. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kiley, could you take the chair? And am I recognizing you? I hope so. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, th I think there's technical reasons why we need to get it on the addits. And that improves what the original motion said, uh, but not everybody is Zoom ready. And, and therefore allowing more than three, I think is, is a really good idea. But remember that our staff, our clerks have to be able to uh, get the invitation, the appropriate invitation uh, to the people at the appropriate time. All of that information, technical information, has to come uh, before the meeting. So I think this is 
uh, the best we can do in a difficult situation. Thank you. I yield the chair back to you, Councillor Neal. Thank you. And Councillor Neal, I have Councillor Stroud uh, requesting to speak. Thank you, and I recognize Councillor Stroud. Thank you. Do I? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and um, thank you, Mayor Patterson, for the motion. Uh, like Councillor McCarrum, I'm a little puzzled about the need for the motion. Um, we all understand we're doing virtual meetings, but I don't remember us passing any bylaws uh, stating different rules for virtual meetings. Now I just we've just had three uh, three times where the mayor has spoken and twice the deputy mayor has spoken in this particular segment. So are the rules of order actually different for Zoom meetings? Is that something that I missed with uh, when I was at the hospital? That's my question to the clerk. I guess. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, yes, there was a change that was done. Our procedural bylaw was amended to restrict delegations during the virtual meetings under this pandemic. So uh, up until now, we were not allowing delegations to appear before council with this motion. Uh, we will allow delegations to appear before council during the uh, virtual meeting phase. So this is just a, another way of enhancing the uh, public participation and the uh, citizen engagement uh, wherein the public has the opportunity to participate okay so uh so if i'm a member of the just uh, if i were a non-council member of the public and i wanted to uh engage council uh, and i've been uh, i've watched council before and i and i know that there's delegations and i i may know that you need to uh apply at the clerk's office and, I, and i've got that much knowledge already uh what uh what more so so how would I know about the new rules? Uh, first of all, the rules that were passed at the, at the outset of the emergency, about the different rules of order, how would I know about the limit of three and how would I know about the, uh, the, the logistics, uh, the, the, the 12 o'clock deadline and, and, all, and all these new details that we're discussing here right now, for anyone that's not watching, how would they know about this? You, Deputy Mayor, uh, that all information will be shared online. We do have an electronic delegation registration form, and all that information will be placed uh, at that uh, particular site to allow members of the public to understand the uh, the changing course. Okay, so uh, I think most of us would agree that what would be ideal is a way, kind of like Councilor McCarran was saying a way to sort of keep it as close to uh, what it was before in terms of accessibility. So you could just, you could, before you could co come to the council chambers, and even if you didn't know anything about, uh, about it because you've never been before, someone in the gallery would quickly fill you in about how you, how you got your name on the list uh, to be a delegation. Um, if that's, uh, now that everybody's uh, watching from home, uh, how do we maximize accessibility? Uh, this motion doesn't speak to that. Uh, it speaks to a limit of three and it speaks to a way to, to, to op reopening it to delegations, uh, something that most members of the public won't know was, was closed. Just the same as most members of the public don't know that uh, we've given emergency powers to the CAO, for example. No, but nobody seems to know about that. Um, so how you said we, we would communicate and how do we maximize accessibility? For example, someone who doesn't have the means or the ability to log on uh, the way that we do with a webcam and so on, uh, is, it, is it possible to take phone calls where they obviously wouldn't be on the screen, but they could still ask their questions or make their comments? Is there a way to make it accessible to those without the means or ability to log on as we have today? You, Deputy Mayor, there are a number of options available to the community to participate uh, at the council meetings, whether it be through telephone, whether it be through submission of a video, or whether it be through a submission of some written material that then is distributed to members of council. So there are a number of accessible options that are available uh, to be able to uh, have the public participation at city council meetings. Yes. 
Okay, and for the um, possibility of someone coming to City Hall, they at this point they may not get in, but at the time that uh, City Hall is uh, a little bit less uh, closed, would there would we anticipate while we're still doing virtual meetings, being able to do as Councillor Neil did, for example, for the first virtual meeting that I attended, he was seemingly in City Hall, I think, uh, maybe in the Councillor's Lounge for that meeting. Is that kind of thing going to be uh, accessible to a mem member of the public that may want to come in and with some IT help and so obviously physical distancing rules in place, uh, would it be possible for, for someone to essentially borrow a computer station to, to partake in the way that we're partaking? We'll be reviewing all options uh, once the pandemic uh, is removed per se. Um, but uh, yes, if City Hall is open, uh, then members of the public will be able to uh, attend City Hall. Um, right now, City Hall is closed, so there aren't that opportunities for members of the public to participate. But on a go-forward basis, I don't see why we will not be able to make some type of uh, decision with respect to having people come here at City Hall. Uh, so, uh, my final question has to do with the, uh, again, to the clerk, procedures uh, procedures during this time. The, so the rules of order and a speaking order, uh, the, you can speak once for each motion at five minute time, then do all those rules still apply? Your Deputy Mayor, you are correct. All those rules still apply. Okay, so so uh, it's up to the chair to enforce, like I, I, I chair a couple of committees. Once those are up and running again, I would follow the same rules of order as before. Would I would I also need to be in proximity to the clerk or would, would it be all virtual where the clerk would be at a different location than me for the, for the committee meeting? We've been able to operate on both scenarios, whether the, uh, the clerk and the chair are in the same facility or whether the clerk is on site. Uh, the preference of the chair with respect to whether or not he would like to have the clerk there with him. We can do right. either. Right. So the, the chair could choose to uh, maintain physical distance uh, uh, at all times from the clerk, but perhaps be in the same room at all ends of the table or something like that. So Deputy that's, Mayor, that's, that is correct. Okay, that's good to hear. And I, I think that I'm okay with the the intent of the motion and uh, the only thing I would caution is that uh, just as I didn't know the things that had changed uh, in the interim, uh, it's of utmost importance that we communicate fully uh, transparently with members of the public and help them as much as possible uh, for those that wish to engage because it's already a barrier to, to do the virtual meeting and, and we want to remove as many barriers as possible to if we want to keep the citizens engaged. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Deputy, Deputy Chair, Chair, I believe I have Councillor Chappelle wishing to speak. And I recognize Councillor Chappelle, even though he's not on my screen. <laughs> oh, there he is. The floor is here. Neil, I, uh, I recognize you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this. I have a couple concerns and I may be just asking for clarification. And that simply is there's a number of very interesting issues coming forward uh, to Council in the next uh, number of weeks and months. We have the issue of fluoridation. We have the issue of uh, impinging on Cataraqui Cemetery, a national historic site with monster towers. We have all kinds of interesting issues coming forward to council. And I wanna make sure the constituents that are concerned with those issues have an opportunity to speak. So if passing this motion allows that, then I'd like to know that. Um, but if, I, if not passing this motion restricts them from having access, I just take the clarity on it, thank you. I believe that's the intent, but I will turn to the person who usually chairs and ask the mayor to respond. I will, I will answer that question. To, to you, Deputy Mayor. So the, the reality is as of now, there are no delegations permitted at council meetings. This motion will provide that opportunity to pretty much get back to business as usual with respect to the three delegations uh, being able to speak to items on the agenda. 
And as we've said, um, there always is the opportunity for members of council to waive uh, the procedural bar to allow additional delegations to speak to items on the agenda. So that hasn't changed. This is basically a way to uh, allow for the public participation through delegations, which was uh, eliminated uh, with the motion that was passed in March. Thank you for the clarity. Thank you for the clarity. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Neal, I believe I saw a hand from Councillor Boehm who wished to speak. I will recognize Councillor Boehm. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair, and uh, through you. I guess my concern with this is if I'm understanding it correctly, we've, we're going from hearing no delegations to, to allowing a maximum of three. Is, is that correct? And I will recognize the mayor who will have to rule on this. Uh, th thank you. I, I'm just happy to respond to questions and I, I I'll think I'll just provide context to the earlier concern of Councillor Stroud. I'm only answering the questions to the motion, not trying to speak several times. But, uh, but Councillor Boehm, um, so our regular procedural bylaw under normal circumstances allows three. for a maximum of three delegations. And then councillors can pass motions to waive the procedural bylaw to allow for additional. So this is basically just giving us basically that exact same setup. So I guess I'm just thinking of the, so in council when we're there, cause I was thinking about some earlier comments where we were thinking about how to actually set this up. So if we're to be fair to our clerks, three people contact them ahead of time, even an hour ahead of time, I'm sure they could figure that out. But as we know, sometimes happens at councils is some people, there's the two or three people that show up the last minute and decide, hey, I want to be a delegation too. I just found out about this five minutes ago. How do we limit those or deal with those? Or how is it fair to the clerks to have somebody kind of come in, you know, five minutes or in the 11th hour and, and ask that? And then the clerks are trying to sort of sell this up and have them try to Zoom meeting as well. So I guess that's kind of my concern there. Do we have a way to that or or are we going with a cutoff of this and i'll recognize the mayor uh, thank you so, so councillor bohm so the way we would manage that is that we would set a deadline that day so we will allow for additional delegations beyond the three but that would require council motions duly moved and seconded but then by having a deadline of noon, the idea is to pr provide additional time then to work at the technical details. The clerk's office can reach out to the person, make sure that they are able to participate, that they know all of those details, how, how that works. So that I think is, is, is the way to, to manage that. Okay, I understand that. I guess I was thinking, if, if the dead, so the deadline is truly the deadline. It's not a recommended deadline and then somebody can come in and say, well, this person didn't know, and so can we waive the bylaw to still let them in? So I guess I'm kind of thinking the deadline's actually the deadline. There's no, once you're past that point, there's nobody that can come during a council meeting and say, hey, I missed it, I, I missed the deadline, can you add me, please? Can we waive the bylaw? I think we've lost our deputy chair. So I- Thank you. I recognize it. Sorry, my dog was calling. Go ahead. Thank you. These, boy, it's going to be hard to go back to the way things get to be. <laughs> This is great. Um, so, uh, Councillor Bob, if I can respond to, to, to that question, I, I think that, um, yeah, I think, I think the way that I would frame the context of, of this motion is that we are, we are moving in steps. So, initially, when we move to electronic format, we don't allow any delegations at all. And, and I was supportive of that only because there was a, so much technical detail that we had to manage just to make sure that all of us could speak to each other and the, the public could listen in and that staff could engage. Now that we've had several council meetings, I think now we're to the point where we can start to, to, to open that up to, to, uh, to delegations from the public as well. So I think that ultimately just hearing from, from staff and what those technical requirements are, I, I think that this is the best way to, um, uh, to balance that. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Mayor, I do not see any more hands uh, wishing to speak.
Okay, I will then call the question. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? I see none. I can, I can confirm the vote as uh, 13 to zero. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I will return the chair. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. We have no other new motions. Are there any notices of motion? Okay, uh, seeing none, um, Mr. Kirkhoff for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Chappelle that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2020 14, held Tuesday, April 21st, 2020, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have some tabling of documents, a number of communications. Is there any other business? Councillor McLaren. Thank you. So this is uh, partly in response to that um, motion. So on a higher level, I don't think we should be using technology to actually limit, or using technology as an excuse to limit um, people's access to us and to these meetings. Technology is supposed to actually make things easier and better. And although we may have a learning curve, I hope that um, we're not going to start using um, the liches as an excuse to make things more difficult for people to actually work with us. So that's just a comment because uh, some of the things I seem to have heard were to, to the technology, we should make the technology so, accommodate to us. Thank you. So, my so thank you. Um, thank you for that. I, I just don't want to open up the door to, to, to re-debate the motion, but point taken, and uh, we will... We will move on. Uh, so with that, is there any other business? Uh, seeing none, then uh, I, Mr. Clerk, ask for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Bowen, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that bylaws one through five be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Bowen, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that bylaws one through five be given their, their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn, please. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Kiley. All those in favor? Opposed? And we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>